Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, from interest on the mailing list, uh, you guys asked me for a session. I signed up for one. I didn't know what the format was going to be. I, uh, I didn't know I'd be actually presenting to you. Uh, I threw together a few slides just to try to keep myself on track, but I don't actually know how to upload them. So um, I'll just kind of get started. Um, this is a, mostly a discussion of anybody who works on this and is, is interested, so we can talk together. Um, I thought it was going to be like just a room, but okay. Um, so I can just start off with my interests. Um, I am the maintainer of res control inside of Google. Google uses it very extensively. Um, essentially, every shared hosting machine in Google's fleet is required to have some sort of mechanism for monitoring, uh, bandwidth enforcement, prioritization. Um, the main goal is to be able to do batch job isolation and identifying jobs that are saturating memory bandwidth because that has become extremely easy to do on modern server processors. Um, so uh, things were fairly straightforward when we were uniform in the types of architectures we were uh, running on, mainly just Intel. Um, we started introducing more ARM servers into the fleet and quickly got complaints from the container management people that there was no res control on ARM. and. Uh, that led to a push of trying to get uh, ARM hardware with MPAM implemented. Um, but uh, as James can attest, um, it's been challenging uh, to get a, a subsystem that was largely designed around Intel RDT to fit into other designs and other systems. Um, there's been a lot of sort of stress about how how an RDT RDT oriented interface would fit MPAM, and I've tried to do a lot of research in the mailing list and the history and the goals of Res Control in general to try to figure out like where it's supposed to fit in. And I guess the bit I have to share and from my experience with the Google users is um, just having a similar interface or even being uh, RDT on Intel or PQOS on AMD. Uh, them being similar, it doesn't it doesn't help all that much other than maybe being able to share code to program it because the actual underlying hardware mechanisms are so different that you really have to understand how they work and how they're implemented to actually program them effectively. Um, the container management developers in Google largely have to special case every last CPU model because of shortcomings in the implementations, differences and how the policies that are specified the same way are actually enforced uh, or just in general how effectively they end how effective they end up being. Uh, there's some implementations where they don't think anything works. Um, so with, with that said, uh, at least my position on it was I, I'm not very concerned with different architectures exposing their native register formats directly as is to user space. Um, I think that's the least of the user's problems, but I'm certainly open to any examples. If anybody's using res control, if they are able to write shared code that uh, programs it on different systems. Right. Um, and otherwise, I guess similarly on that topic uh, with monitoring also, um, almost any dis discussion about memory bandwidth that was monitored has to be qualified with what system was it, where in the system topology was the measurement taken, how exactly is the measurement done, and then only then can you really discuss what you've actually got? But I don't think that's all that different from perf events where you have to understand exactly what the event is and what the system is to understand its significance. Um, anyways, um, I would also just like to open this up to others who are working on porting res control to talk about their experience or how this is going. Um, <laughs> 
we've got two of you here. So I, I also would be curious if how people are using this in production. Um, I've seen code in Libvirt that attempts to to configure the um, TPPM bitmaps, um, if that's the Intel term, um, for for L3. So I'm I'm quite keen to have that kind of code portable between architectures. Uh, I think that's it's quite important to have um have user space understand how do I find out what this schema means, where do the IDs come from in SysFS and so on. I think having that structure, I agree absolutely to actually know what the value you should program is, you're going to need to know a bit more about the hardware. But mm -hmm. I think that that comes from a policy and the, the framework for actually shoving those values in, and try and keep it as common as possible. But um, yeah, every platform is going to have platform specific stuff and it's going to end up looking, I guess, a bit like EDAC, where there's specific drivers for specific things, but then the, the framework for driving it all is, is common. Mm -hmm. so that's my view, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, at least from a recent discussion, it seemed like in MPAM, there seemed to be a hang up about something needing to be called L3 because RDT and PQOS both have a resource called that. But then in MPAM and I guess uh, from the patch from a MIT from Marvell, there was an argue, it seemed there was an, uh, a hot topic about uh, monitoring that's done on a memory controller versus monitoring that's done on, an, on a share on a ca last level cache controller. And he seemed to run into trouble because somehow the structure forced him to call them different resources. Um, I was, I was going to argue like they're adjacent. So you could say they're both roughly at level three in the memory subsystem. Um, so you could call them collectively L3, but that there was some re some reason, something in the structure of the MPAM port that said they had to be distinct and different resources. Okay, um, I'd probably have to go through the code to, to work out what that is. I think the, the MPAM driver tries to be agnostic of res control and then have some glue layer between that picks what it's going to expose based on what can be exported, mm -hmm. um, which was to try and keep keep that stuff contained. I think if you're if you're choosing what to expose, um, yeah, I guess it's expecting them to be the same resource. Um, so that's that's coming from the way the MBA um, megabytes per second uh, feature in Res Control works, where it's mm -hmm. reading the bandwidth counters and then fiddling with the controls. Yeah. So if you're reading the, the, the bandwidth counters of the memory controller and fiddling with the bitmap controls on the L3, mm -hmm. if those don't match exactly in the topology, you're going to get some really weird behavior. That, that might be the best you can do, and that might be what you want, um, mm -hmm. but we, we probably need to make a decision there about do we do that by default, or we had, do we have some some flag to say, yeah, really force this on because um, yeah. I want this even if it's going to behave weird. The thing that collapsed most immediately was um, the MBPS controller has to know what is the monitoring resource and the Marvell implementation had two. Yeah, okay. And I think the, the comments, at least in the driver, say try and pick the closest one to the where the controls are, mm -hmm. where the whether that's what the code is doing or not, I'd have to look. Yeah, I think that was a tough place where you quickly ran into the issue. Do you, does, does the MPAM driver have to present a L3 resource like the Intel and AMD implementations did, or is it free to present it any way at once? Yeah, um, so for, for what I've been telling ARM's partners for quite a few years now, um, is if they build something that looks like a Xeon, then they'll get res control working earlier once we get feature parity. Mm -hmm. And if they've got things that don't quite fit into that, then I'm afraid it's going to be waiting until after we've got feature parity to then discuss with uh, Intel, AMD, RISC-V, whoever's got similar features, how we add schemata mm -hmm. uh, that describe that kind of thing. So that's, that's why I'm pushing hard on, no, it's got to be L2 or L3. It's got to look like a Xeon. Um, yeah just for keeping that user space interface identical until we've got feature parity. And if that means not supporting all the hardware, I'm fine with that for now. Yeah. Now, how 
I guess the other point I was raising before, like, was questioning how how critical uh, interface parity is. Um, well, is it is it should it be a huge concern that you don't have a resource called L three necessarily when it takes such in depth knowledge of the of the system architecture to program the values anyways. Tom doesn't have an L3. Oh, it's it's a <laughs> quagmire of what do you think these terms mean? Um, yeah, but, uh, I'm, I'm saying that for the market. Okay. So yeah, you, I'm saying there's a third level of the memory subsystem. Yeah, but that's what other people mean. <laughs> yeah. There might be quite a few more than that in some <laughs> systems. Yes. And the L3 and the DDR controller may have entirely separate controls for entirely different things and entirely yeah. separate monitoring because you want to take into account stuff that is bypassing the L3. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on your cache topology and whether it's inclusive and a whole bunch of stuff. So the, the, the complexity gets really nasty really quickly. And frankly, our systems don't look like a zeal. So we're going to be, I mean, to be fair, we've been carrying stuff on top of res control and shipping it for four years. Mm -hmm. um, with a heck of a lot of extra stuff, um, because yeah, we didn't obey James's instructions mainly because he told us later. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say when when we were working on the draft spec for the RISC Five QoS um, in the proof of concept, we did we had a system with a uh, last level cache, but then we also mm -hmm. have three DDR memory controllers, mm -hmm. and it felt really weird to pretend like those were L three. Mm -hmm. um, which is what I did for the proof of concept, but then it got really weird because you have like three L3s, four, sorry, four L3s. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a last level cache, which is kind of like an L3, and then the other three are DDR memory controllers. So it just seemed really weird and, and, and uh, felt like I was trying to shove something into something it didn't fit. Yeah, so I think mm -hmm. that breaks the API because the, the IDs for this command for L3 are supposed to be the cache info files um, under syskernel devices, CPU, whatever the horrible string is. So I think we, I'd really like to stick to that because that's that's how user space finds out which CPUs um, does this configuration apply to. And that's that's the kind of stuff I'd like to try and keep standard between architectures. If we go adding an L4 or an HMAP memory side cache or something, that's all great. <laughs> um, they don't look like a Xeon, that doesn't matter. We can. So I was planning to talk about that stuff once there's feature parity if we want to try and do it before. I think. Um, Tony Lux um, certainly in the clustering series has something that looks starts to look a bit like a HMAP memory side cache, but it's not it's not exactly that because it's a uh, Intel specific thing. Yeah, so if, if something if something doesn't make sense, so the then, yeah, best thing is to streamer. just uh, not do anything for the memory controllers until later. Well, so the memory controllers show up somewhere under SysFS, right? And they're going to have an ID associated with them. So I would. And they, use command to a new type of resource and then say, here's how you find out what the IDs and which NUMA node or set of CPUs are associated and would be affected by that control. Because that's, if you're doing task placement to, so reusing um, closets or whatever the terms are, um, if I apply different configurations and different sides, because I'm trying to reuse these things, I need to do task placement with task set to, to make that effective. So I have to know which CPUs are affected or which ranges of memory. Um, so that's that's where knowing that information from the schemata and the IDs comes important. So, but with the like existing headers, is there a place to add in that or? Uh, so after all, moving around, um, yeah, they they there's an enum um, for the resource types under uh, include Linux res control types, um, and sure, not every architecture is going to have one of these, but you end up with um, a function to say, give me the one of these if you've got one. Um, and I think today my plan was it has to return a struct, but it could say that it's not alloc capable and not monitor capable either. So you can have a dummy one you return for the resources you don't implement. Um, we could go through and have null checks all over the place for it if that's simpler. But yeah, okay. add, add a, so add a new resource, it's a new entry in that enum. Um, and if, if we end up with lots of these, we might want to rethink the interface to, to make it easier for an architecture to add them. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say once your current series gets merged, then it would be possible for another architecture to like add a new resource yeah. type into the yeah. header? So I think okay. um, I think that's the way the AMD SMBA, I'm going to get the term wrong, the, the CXL slow memory interface. That's how that oh works. yeah, they added a new type, yeah. right? Yeah, so exactly yeah. like that. 
Okay, okay. I guess right now the thing that prevents that is there's there's no way to do it until your series uh, gets right. merged, right? Yeah, it's not going to work on non XM6 yeah, 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 until yeah. then. So. Yeah, okay. So speaking of, of, of the mark, oh, oh, sorry. yeah. Hmm. So so speaking of the patches, uh, uh, I know James posted a, the latest version of your patch series a couple of weeks back. Um, do you have a feeling of sort of where it is on it on its journey uh, now? There's some comments. I haven't looked at them yet because I was traveling. Yeah, to get hit. yeah, um, sure. I don't know what day of the week it is even anymore. Um, to be fair, I don't know this. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the the comments from the last round at least were were approaching um, sort of consensus and agreement. And I, I don't think there'd be anything major, but I've not looked to see what Lynette said about the last posting. Um, so yeah, in terms of for everybody else in the room and anybody on the call, um, the the series on the list is splitting up the locking and exposing some stuff that's a bit weird in MPAM to the, rule, the core res control code. Um, and after that, there's one more series, which is almost entirely renames and the, the last patch in that moves all the code out to FS. Um, and I, I plan to post that as one series, but I suggest the, the, the patch that moves everything gets merged separately, but it, it depends on the deadlines. So what's, what's, your, what's your feeling on you know, next, next merge cycle? It's not my gift to give. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair. So at any time, someone might find a horrific bug, in which case I'd yeah, back yeah, to drawing. Back board, to the so. okay. Let's go the other way for the MPAM stuff. Assuming that stuff all drops nicely, mm -hmm. what is the most useful thing for other people to do to get stuff quicker? Yeah, that's fair. So the, the, the steps after that go boom, 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 once the, the generic stuff is in place. What can people do to help you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, which will obviously help every other architecture to to some. Yeah. So well, so the once um, so there's this current series. Once that's merged, there's one more, and then the yeah. path would be clear for Risk Five, for example, to to support um, risk control in terms of getting MPAM supported. There's two or three series that can be posted in parallel, um, and the one that adds all the driver. And I, I expect adding the driver to be straightforward because it doesn't regress existing systems. So I'd be very surprised if anybody even reviews it, but I'll post it. What are you so, saying? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've had, um, so I, I don't know if Armit's in the room, I've had um, a few bug reports from Armit, um, who's been kicking this harder than I can do with the FVP um, ARM software model, um, and finding bugs, which has been good. Uh, so going beyond that, uh, one of the fun things that MPAM has is the ID space problems and the fact that every ID space in MPAM is of a different size. So thoughts on the performance monitoring IDs versus um, what the other ones are, partition IDs. Um, so what, what do you mean, what kind of problem are you trying to solve? I thought we were still in the stage where we basically had to make them the same size, or have I lost track? I thought they um, were different on Intel already. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, let's jump on narrowing. <laughs> okay. So, so to the the previous question um, about so there's, there's two different aspects to this. Um, so Intel, or sorry, x86 has got closet that is used to index the controls, um, and Ahmed, which is a totally independent number, um, which is used for the monitors. Um, MPAM has a, a part ID, which is pretty much identical to the closet, but it's Performance counter, it, um, performance ID is a thing called PMG, and that extends the, the part ID field. So the, the monitors match on both fields. Um, and that, that complicates things, but it's it's something that, with this series that's currently on the list, is all hidden in res control. And it, it affects when you do allocation, you have to try and search for one that's the most clean um, and deal with things by index as opposed to just this is the closet I want. But that's, that's all straightforward and hidden in the driver. What you, what you might, um, the other way of looking at your question was the, the number of monitors. So um, the x86 Intel machine under my desk at work has got, I think, 112 ARMID, and it's got 112 counters. So you, there's not a separate concept for that. For MPAM, there is a separate concept. Um, so each gadget out in the system memory map can have a number of monitors implemented, and that might not be enough. Um, so say you've had 112 um, 
combinations of path ID and PMG, you might only have four monitors, in which case you can't leave these things free running, which is what you have to do for res controls interface for the bandwidth monitoring. Um, so today, or at least the, the driver in my tree at the moment is if there are enough, it'll turn that on uh, and you'll get those files appear in res control, just like you would on a, a Xeon. Um, and if you don't, those files are missing. Um, I had a suggestion of a command line argument to artificially reduce the number of part IDs so that maybe you could suddenly make it so they were enough by giving up some of the controls. Um, nobody's come forward saying that works for them. Um, the, other way, the other way forward I had, um, or giving up one set of hardware to use another, uh, tough stuff. Um, the other way was to try and do this all by perf and to have a way of saying, um, perf, please monitor this res control control group and I want to know about the bandwidth. Um, and that would give us the start and stop events to go and allocate a monitor in this, these hardware gadgets. And when we run out, we can just fail, fail to open the perf event and say, sorry, there's not enough resources in the PME to do that. Um, there is some history, uh, which yeah. you, you and I have been talking about. Um, I was checking to see if Babu was here still. Uh, yeah, he so was. Not having enough counters is a problem he knows all about. Yeah. So I, I would love to, to make that work for all architectures. The way, the way that's structured at the moment is, is a, a sort of rest control PM, and that uses the... You're, you're, you're cutting in and out there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, it's structured as a res control PMU using the, the API of, that exists between res control and the architecture. Mm -hmm. So that works on all architectures. Uh, amusingly, the ARM software model for this stuff doesn't support the counters at all. It returns zero for everything. So I've done all the testing on x86, um, where it mm -hmm. works fine. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my plan for those two. Um, you brought up another one, narrowing. Um, yeah, narrowing matters. Uh, so... For those in the room and those on the call, um, uh, if you've got a, a closet, which is your index for the controls, one of the things you have to do on, on any architecture is run around the system and work out what the, the common minimum number is. Because when one gets allocated, you need to be able to configure it on every resource in the system because you're going to get a configuration for any resource in the system that goes with this closet. Um, part ID narrowing is a very annoying feature uh, in the MPAM spec that allows one of these gadgets in the interconnect to say, I don't actually have that many configurations. I can pass through that number of closets, so I don't change the values, but you can only configure three. Um, so today, the driver will take that to mean you only support three, and that means there's always um, as many configurations. Um, it is possible if you know this, um, this resource is sort of the end of the line. So if you know it's the memory controller, you could sort of reduce the resolution of the controls so that you can sort of pre-allocate um, pre -allocate the configurations that you do match. So then by reducing the resolution of the controls, user space could only express three different controls, which means you can pre-allocate them and then set up the mapping when the configuration is applied. I think that would work, but you'd get some weird effects because of the sharing when you're mapping Part ID six and twelve both go to three because you've only got three. So if, if folk want that um, and they're happy with the weird sharing effects, that's a thumbs up. Okay, um, then sure. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I think the key thing on this is what you touched on earlier with the introduction. This when you get into the business of using the narrowing stuff deliberately, you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> if it was an entirely custom interface, it would be fine. And I mean, I. Don't think I'm sharing too much detail to say. We use the narrowing stuff aggressively. The number of IDs in some things are a tiny fraction of where they are in things where there's a much bigger resource to control. Um, and it's just going to get worse. Are, are, so in, in what you have, do you allow the um, supported number of control groups to be very small? I, I, I guess I well, would Today up. it has to be very small. Okay. because we have to go with the narrowest ID. With the irony of this is you have to go with the narrowest ID even if you're not controlling. Mm -hmm. And that, that's another thing to do would be to be able to, when you mounted res control, say chicken bit an entire level. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't care about L2. Yeah. Because it then gives you the flexibility to use the fact you've got more groups at say L3, DDR. Okay, yeah, yeah. Interestingly, this, this happens on the, the X86 Intel machine under my desk. Uh, it supports 16 closet for the L3. 
but the MB controller only supports eight. Yep. So if you turn them off on the command line, you get a different number. So that's that's the behavior um, that we're talking about here to then try and make use of that hardware always by, by doing some kind of combining. And the path ID narrowing lets you do that. Um, yeah, you're, you're not the only person to ask for it. So. OK. Yeah, to that, I, I guess one of the other portability issues in the file system level I was wondering about was does the file system have any business at all uh, holding on to close ID and re RMID numbers? <laughs> so I, I think um, Tony Luck disagrees with the, the way I did this and we, we might change it yet. Um, today, with my changes in the series, the allocation all gets done by the res control file system code. Mm -hmm. My reason for that is the, the ARMID in particular uh, rest control maintains the limbo list for which ones are clean and how yeah. clean they are. So then when you, when you go to allocate, you need to consult that list and every architecture will have that if it has caches because you, you've got dirty state in the caches. Yeah. And I, I didn't want that duplicated between architectures. Um, I kept the closet allocation in res control as well, simply because for MPAM, those two are the, kind of the same value and you have to look at one to know which one to allocate. Um, so that's, that's why it's done like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, does get interesting if you've got something else trying to allocate a closet and set something up. So you might have, um, so the ARM has support for this stuff in the GIC and the, which is the interrupt controller and the RMMU. Um, and you might have some static configuration you want to apply there for, I don't know, your camera or something. Um, and it does get a bit annoying if oh, you've got to go and allocate one of these in the kernel and set it up, but you can't because there's this file system thing that does the allocation. So the mm -hmm. the idea there was some shift happens somewhere in one of the helpers, but it's a bit nasty. Just tell people that's policy and shove it to user's face and tell them to go away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just make it on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Anybody else have any other questions? Any other uh, res control users who want to share any experiences with us? All right. Uh, I have one question. Oh, uh, Amit. Yeah. Uh, actually, do we support uh, cleaning up the cleaning up the ampem configuration after we done working with? For instance, we have eighty different partitions. And we configure all those partition with the, a particular uh, uh, bandwidth allocation. And once we are done with the, this, I mean, uh, task, suppose testing this task, uh, those configuration configuration are still present on in the system registers. So, uh, do we support cleaning up the configurations once we unmount a resource control? Suppose. Um, did you get that? I, so I, I might need to clarify, ask what your question. So um, when you unmount res control, there is a call called reset all resources, right. um, and that runs through every resource and applies uh, whatever the reset configuration is. Um, and MPAM should be doing that. Uh, if there's not as a bug, uh, please let me know. Oops. Was that that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, it's it's definitely something we've encountered. Uh, corruption in the data structures sometimes causes the system to blow up when you unmount res control. <laughs> okay, yeah, I've not done an awful lot of kicking at the unmount path, but yes, um... we have a, it does it does have to go around uh, clearing the configurations everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you have a domain that you missed that got uh, hot unplugged, you might discover it on unmap. When, so this should all be serializing for CPU hot plug. Um, when C, the last CPU on a domain goes away, um, main structure should be freed. And right. When it comes back, it should be reset to the default if the hardware's not done that. Um, yeah, there's, and there's also, I think, a, a set something, some sort of set all default values whenever a yeah. domain comes up. Yeah, so that's that's the the XXS code that does that. Um, yeah, and MPAM should be doing the same. It's got I forget the name. Um, if if we want something similar to this unmount path, there's um, 
npm has an error interrupt, uh, which means it, all, all the error values indicate a software bug. Um, so the, the idea, well, my idea there is if that goes off, which I never expect it to do, um, to try and tear down the file system even when it's running, uh, REST control does have all this code marked exit, which has never been run. Um, mm -hmm. So npm will, will be able to run that and all the exit markers get dropped. Um, so that, that'll get interesting. Um, but last time I tried it, I think there was a reference counting problem. Some bits of the file system stayed there when they shouldn't uh, for the future. Yeah. James, don't make your life hard. Oh, Just crash the system if you get that. It's a straightforward software bug. We need. Since you're saying, uh, it's a. Or as from what it sounds like, if you misprogram it, report the problem asynchronously. <laughs> yeah, the hardware does that. Yeah. Um, Kind of a different subject, but I mean, I guess Tony didn't join, but I mean, I had found the Res Control 2 test series interesting, and I would be interested if anyone else had thoughts about that. I mean, you seem to be one of the main users of it, so I don't know how how you would, what you think of that. Or... What was good about I mean, it, the different, it seemed like it would be easier to create new types of resources. But what you were saying earlier maybe solves the problem. It just seemed like when I was trying to implement an interface for the RISC-5 uh, spec um, that uh, I was trying to shove things into things that they didn't fit, right? Um, so maybe it was just I should I could have created new types of resources. Um, but I mean, I guess Tony talked about that in like the patches that he wrote. So I was thinking, oh, maybe this is a this is a better way to model um, the system. Existing users don't want to switch to like a new way of doing things, and I said it wouldn't be very useful. I think existing, I, I think I think existing users are fine switching over, right? Take C groups and C groups too. It's a very quick and easy process, and it takes ten minutes to, and and you pick up on my sarcasm eventually, right? So, so I think I think it's uh, I think uh, you know uh, the key is to let let, let let's uh, clean up rest control first. Right, get 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 it out of Arch x86 and all that, and then let's look at reinventing the wheel because it'll be years and years and years. To really? all right, Johnson disagrees. So no, 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 not not at all. Linus is just not going to take it. It's a straightforward ABI breakage. People will scream. It's not going anywhere if the ABI changes. You can change anything internally, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything about the mount pods, all that yeah. stuff, but nothing that fundamentally affects it. We can add stuff. Yeah. Not taking anyone. And that was totally safe. Let's do the first thing first. Yeah, the other question I had was, um, you mentioned after the current series that you have that there'd be another um, series of patches to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the current series is splitting up the locking and exposing this weird MPAM thing. The one after that is, um, so it's in my tree on kernel.org, it's, it's all renames um, of saying what, what gets exported from the file system to the architecture code or back the other way. Uh, moving stuff into headers. Um, I don't think there's any functional change anywhere. Um, the, and then the last patch is the thing that just moves all the code around. Mm -hmm. um, so that's if the if the current series is, has not got glaring bugs, then the end is in sight. So we'll see. Start is in sight. <laughs> <laughs> The, the amount of time we're going to spend discussing ABI yeah. for all of the myriad of extra controls that exist mm -hmm. is, we, yeah, we've got years of work there. Um, but to be honest, what's going to happen is that everyone's going to carry a whole load of out, out of tree stuff for a while with crazy ABI. I mean, having some discussion path for that that doesn't distract from the other stuff might be useful, mm -hmm. um, even if it's just we start pasting crazy documents somewhere and share them. That say, how about this? I, so we can move that way. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for Schemata, new Schemata, I would, I would like them to have the domain IDs keyed from something else in SysFS. I think that property of L3 is, or L2 and L3 is really good. Um, so obviously memory side caches do that by the NUMA node or the some ID for the memory controller if there's more than one. Um, I, I would like to get to the point where we can say that this control has a type of, say, bitmap 
or percentage or something like that so that different architectures can say so mpam has both mm -hmm. a, a fractional bitmap so a fractional value and a bitmap for the the caches uh, and i can only support one of them today uh, because the other one doesn't doesn't do isolation so it'd be really good to expose in some architecture agnostic way um what mm -hmm. type of configuration is uh, yeah. so that you can just say oh okay that one's in megabytes per second on amd as opposed to it's a percentage as it is on intel cleaning mm -hmm. that stuff up um and making it work on other architectures too would be good yes yes yeah i i think in, in my opinion um an abi breakage is if you change the behavior of an existing resource um, if we invent new ones, we should try to talk to the rest of the res control users to make sure we agree on how the new resource uh, appears. Yeah. So, so to to take the the example we've got at the moment, and you correct me when I get this wrong, I think on the, the MB resource on Intel takes a percentage, mm -hmm. uh, and on AMD it's a value in megabytes a second. Mm -hmm. And correct. you just you just have to call CPU ID to know which one it is, right? There's no other way of discovering it. So to to add a property of L3 config type that just mm -hmm. says percentage, megabytes a second, fraction, whatever the other values are, um, that wouldn't change the behavior and it would be documenting to the existing system. Yeah. Uh, and that would let me support more than more than just what looks like a Xeon on, on it, uh, MPAM. That, and that difference was the only the beginning of Borglet's difficulties with two different implementations. <laughs> okay. They, they generally need to qualify the implementation because there's so many things unspecified, so many things that are vague about these register interfaces, what behavior actually results that um, you, they ended up with just giant tables of CPU model numbers. There's a lot of microarchitecture stuff that becomes relevant when you start mm -hmm. poking in the corners. So. Yes. For, for example, they know, they have to know that, Intel MBA uh, allocates, processes the percentage per CPU, while AMD processes it per L3 domain. So the L3 domain doesn't know which CPU is which, but it, it ends up that you, run, you allocate more bandwidth than you think you did on Intel because it gets multiplied by the number yep. of CPUs okay. yeah. in the domain. So where is the regulation happening for this reason? Yeah. So we don't need to fix that description. Let's make sure for the ARM stuff, we have a nice clean description field that we fill in with what the individual platform is doing, yeah. which probably needs to be configurable because someone will have built them both. I, yeah. I think I think to be most helpful that uh, you should try to present something that is easy to look up in a reference manual. Yeah. Because what, what reference manuals? Uh, the <laughs> reference manual for whatever hardware you purchased and you're yeah. using. <laughs> <laughs> As you you are going to have to read about what it does before you program it. I there are things there are things people are never going to state in detail about mm -hmm. what it does they may well state to a large customer but they ain't going to be sticking it in any no. of the common manuals yes. we say the stuff that may or may not be entirely compliant with the spec i'm yeah. not hinting at anything there we, we we do everything exactly how arm wrote the spec as you mm -hmm. <laughs> at least from the historic arguments about what resulted in the interface today, there was debates about whether the kernel should be expected to translate uh, an intended behavior into a register configuration. And they reached a consensus yeah. to punt on that. They said it was infeasible. Yeah, so, so um, that decision is why only the bitmaps can be supported currently. Um, with the existing L3 schema, because that implies isolation between the, the bitmap values, which means I can't use the, the cache capacity controls the MPAM has. But if we if we come up with some way of exposing those as separate schemata or properties of the existing schemata, if you like, mm -hmm. then um, that moves us on from that. But it's it moves more work to user space as opposed to having a, a policy um, which would let yeah. Ranger hardware be hidden um, in the kernel, which surely is the kernel's job. But 
Uh, like, we are where we are. In that, in that case, I think it was Gleixner who just said, uh, the sysadmin has to know how their heart, what their, what hardware they're on. Yeah, hence your big table of CPU IDs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I ran out of time, but I don't think anybody's coming after this. One question I, I have that, um, and currently the MPAM driver hides uh, a whole load of the hardware that it can't expose via res control. Some of this has got um, counters, cache counters, bandwidth counters, um, and the, the PMU stuff, um, currently I'd like to get away with, with naming it. So it's like, oh, this is L3 like it is in res control, because I think mm -hmm. that's more useful for user space. But for the stuff that's not exposed, I was thinking about um, just exposing these things by ID. So, oh yeah, the, the device with ID5, go, go read the bandwidth counter. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd have to decompile ACPI tables or, or read this manual if you have manuals for a platform um, to know what that is. And I, I think that fits with the way PMUs work for sort of vendor-defined events for the yeah. um, the own core PMUs. Yeah, but all we're doing there is we're pushing it into perf tool. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be the same. Maybe, yeah, maybe perf tool is then what hides that, and the, the vendor publishes a, a name for that counter. Is there are are there generated names like from the ACPI device tree of where of exactly what how how you, how you uh, name a device? I could try that. That'd be horrific, but yeah. Sure. Um, but I mean, that's in perf. You end up with generated names if you don't have a friendly name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of the ones that kick around from ACPI are simply the offset inside the table, which yeah. is wonderful for reading because you have to go and disassemble the table to figure out what on earth was that had offset. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's <laughs> let's not do that. If, if there are things we can't ID because they're not currently described, let's fix that. It's not hard to add topology description to the kernel mm -hmm. if it's something that you can draw on a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's too complicated for drawing on a whiteboard, good luck. Mm -hmm. um, but diagrams are good. We like diagrams in kernel docs. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> all right. Is there anything else? If there's nothing else, I'll, I'll let you all go and we can go eat. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for putting this together. Yeah, thank you.